Hey, good morning, church. I'm Pastor Chad with Mohican Church. So glad you could join us this morning as we uh, get into the Word on this second Sunday of Advent in uh, 2021. Going to be looking today uh, at, uh, at peace, at a gift for the Christ child, which is a life of peace. As you know, uh, perhaps as you know, we've been uh, just started last week going through the Advent season, looking at the different themes of Advent and, and actually considering how we might use those uh, to offer something to the Lord. Um, and so looking at gifts that we could actually give to him, what is it that we could give to the Lord this Advent season? Last week we looked at a life of hope. Uh, considering the hope, the certainty that we have in Jesus and what we know to be true, um, and, and living that out as an act of worship to him. And so we're going to be looking uh, in the same way today at peace, a life of peace. And so we're going to be one of the scripture uh, texts that we will be in this morning is John chapter 14, verses 25 through 31. But before we get into it, will you join me as we go to prayer this morning? Father God, we thank you this morning for the, uh, the beauty of the season. Lord, realizing that, uh, that for some of us, it is a beautiful time of year. For others of us, Lord, it is, uh, it is fraught with brokenheartedness and, and trouble. Father, I pray that you would meet us exactly where we are. I thank you that you know us all together. I pray that you would draw near to yourself the, those who are hurting. Lord, whether it's because of loss of loved ones this past year, whether it's because of broken relationships, whether it's just because of the uncertainty of, of life, perhaps it's because of the hopelessness uh, that they face because they don't know the peace that, that you offer in Jesus. Father, I pray that you would meet each of us where, where it is that we are Lord, I pray that as we open up your word and we consider who you are this Advent season, as we're looking ahead to celebrating the, the first coming of the Savior, and as we look ahead to the second coming of the Savior, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see you for who you are clearly. God, as we open up the word, I pray that you would help us to see us for who we are clearly as we open up the word. I pray that you would stir up our hearts, uh, stir up in our hearts the faith. Father, in awe, maybe this Christmas season that hasn't been there for a long time, maybe never has. I pray that you would help us to, as we hear your word, help us to, to receive it, help us to hear it. We thank you, Father. I thank you for the opportunity to open your word. I thank you for um, the ability to share with my brothers and sisters in this format this morning. I pray your hand of blessing upon them. Father, and on, on all of us as we hear your word. It is, it is awesome. And so here we are, Lord. We wait upon you in expectation. In Jesus' name. So gifts for the Christ child. Uh, and, and we began to, to actually think about the, that theme, kind of in that direction, uh, as we were considering what it is that we tend to do during the Christmas season. We tend to, uh, to look forward. Even now, you'll see ads all over the place trying to encourage us to, to go get that special gift for that special person. Um, and so Christmas time tends to be one where we are always giving gifts to one another. And, and as we stop and consider, you know, uh, we celebrate the birth of the Christ. We celebrate uh, this, this coming down of, of, of salvation to us and the, the love that, that drew salvation's plan, the grace that brought it down to us. And, and as we go through this Advent season, um, I do believe that it is, uh, it is, is altogether appropriate for us to consider what is it that we can give you, Lord, in an act of worship, as an act of worship, in thanksgiving for what you have done for us. And so 
today give for the Christ child a life of peace. It is what we are called to. Perhaps you have noticed that the world has long been without peace. You know, one of the, uh, one of the antonyms of peace, uh, the opposite, is if, if you would look it up in, um, you know, look it up in a, uh, in, a, in a thesaurus, you look it up in a dictionary, you'll a lot of times be able to see the synonyms, the, the, the antonyms, what mean the same and what mean the opposite. And, and one for peace, one antonym, an opposite of peace would be conflict. Now, you probably don't have to look around very long before you realize that, that the world is not saturated with peace. Instead, actually, it appears many times that the world is saturated with conflict and is spotted with times of peace, relative peace. The world has long been without peace from the time uh, of the fall in Genesis chapter 3 that we read of in Genesis chapter 3. That is when the, the world began to experience conflict rather than peace. Look around, we see all kind of, uh, all kind of evidences of this lack of peace. We see disease, we see wars. Think about what we have going on right now. We see a lack of peace regarding this, uh, this pandemic that, that has been going on for a while. There's, there's conflict. There is, there is unrest in hearts all across the globe. Wars. Uh, wars. Rumors of wars. Unrest between people groups. It is, it, there's always something going on in this world. There's unrest and there's conflict in, um, in relationships. And so on a smaller scale, instead of the world scale, there, there are conflicts in relationships. Those seem to be magnified, or at least maybe paid more attention to, more noticeable, even this time of year, as we are approaching the holidays, as we have just gone through Thanksgiving, and now we are approaching Christmas. Some of those tensions in relationships, the unrest, the conflicts, they, they become more magnified. Why is that? Usually it's because families tend to get together during these times. And if there's conflict, the families may not get together at all. Or, if they do, it is super awkward. Because some people that, are, that have conflicts going on between them just don't talk to one another. Or... They exchange pleasantries while there's a deep-seated hatred, really, going on there. There's conflict and there's a lack of peace in, in relationships and, 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 and in uncertainties, just general uncertainties in life. We experience a lack of peace many, many times. And so the world has long been without peace. And therefore, the world has long anticipated the coming of the Prince of Peace. One of the scripture references, well, the scripture we were in last week uh, was on Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 is a prophecy of the coming Messiah. And, and part of that prophecy described him as the Prince of Peace. And so for many, 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 many years, the world has longed for the coming of this Prince of Peace, to, to deal with all of the conflict and the unrest, to deal with all of these things that we, that we struggle with, to address the lack of peace. Come, O oh Prince of Peace. Ever since, as I mentioned before, ever since in Genesis chapter 3, the fall, um, there has been a long awaiting for this Prince of Peace. Why a longing for one to come to bring peace? Because we just cannot manufacture it ourselves. Oh, we've tried. As a matter of fact, we have come up with so many quick fixes to try to, to, to fix the issue or to dull the pain. These things don't really bring peace. These things sometimes bring, uh, bring what might be, look like a symptom of peace, but it's not real, lasting peace. We cannot manufacture. We can't try hard enough and make it work. 
you can uh, you probably have been made aware that there have been many uh, many um, uh, many people trying to bring about peace. It's kind of uh, it's kind of uh, I find it funny that sometimes in the, the the pageants, you know, where they're asking ladies all of these questions, like what's your greatest desire, and and it's kind of a joke that uh, that. You know, many of them would end up saying world peace. Yeah, that is a desire for so many. That is a longing in the heart. And it has been something that, that has been tried to be worked out among parties of different nations. I think about the Middle East. And there have been historically so many people trying to make peace happen. But why doesn't it? We cannot manufacture peace. We just can't manufacture it. That is why there is such a high anticipation of the Prince of Peace, the one that can come from outside of this place and bring it. Because it's not here. It is not here. We cannot find it. And so, um, in that awaiting of the Prince of Peace, there are many different, uh, many different prophecies regarding the Prince of Peace. A couple that I want to point out. One of them being Isaiah chapter 2. In verse 4, this is, uh, this is going to be one of the symptoms of the Prince of Peace coming. Is this, listen, he shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. Uh, look at that. I mean, look at, that, look at that symptom of the coming of the Prince of Peace. Nation won't rise up against nation anymore. They won't practice war anymore. They, they won't have any use for their implements of war. And so they will actually repurpose them into, into tools that they can use because they don't need to use them in war anymore. This is one of the things that peoples from long ago and ever since have been anticipating, the coming of this Prince of Peace. Can you imagine can you imagine the, the widespread lack of conflict? Oh, man, do you desire it? Do you desire a day when nation shall not rise up against nation and there will be no more use of implements of war? This has been one of the things anticipated from years past. and something prophesied that would happen. Another one, if you were here with us this morning um, in person, in worship, you would have heard read Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. Um, one of the prophecies of the coming of the Prince of Peace, it says this, Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea. This is the kind of stuff long hoped for long waited for by peoples from old. The coming of the Prince of Peace that, that, would, uh, that would usher in a worldwide peace, a worldwide lack of conflict, not only among people, but also in the natural world. O come, Prince of Peace. Jump ahead then to his arrival and hang with me here as we're considering uh, a life of peace being offered up for the Lord. Jump ahead then to his arrival. I mean, finally, he has come. He has come. This, this one who has been long, long waited for, he, his, his birth happened in a lowly place. You can see that in Luke chapter 2. We'll get into that in, in weeks coming. His birth was, uh, was in a lowly place. It was foretold, or it was, uh, it was announced excuse me, in the fields to the shepherds by the angels. And the shepherds were told, listen, 
The one has been born that you have been waiting for. Now they, de they declare peace on earth, goodwill to men has come. Can you imagine the delight of the shepherds? Can you imagine the delight of a people who waited so long for this to happen? For this peace to come? Listen, I can only imagine what, <laughs> in my imagination, I can, I can only imagine what this scene could have looked like as a people who long awaited the Prince of Peace and knew these prophecies well, I can only imagine what, the, what might have gone through some of their heads during this time of the first advent of the Prince of Peace. Can you picture this? Can you, can you picture this? Uh, this may, I'm sure, may not have happened at all, but it could have. Can you picture us knowing, perhaps knowing the prophecies that we even just read in Isaiah? Can you imagine the shepherds being, being told by a heavenly host of angels that the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, has come? Knowing the prophecies, knowing that they declare peace on earth right now. What's one thing that shepherds did? They protected the flock. They protected the flock of sheep that they were entrusted to. And, and it was their job to not only lead them to where they could find sustenance, lead them to where they could find water, um, but it was their job to protect them. Because, well, there were predators out there. Predators that would attack the sheep. Do you recall the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 11, the wolf will lie with the lamb? <laughs> Listen, I can only imagine when, a, when one of the shepherds might have heard that the Prince of Peace was now here. I could even see one of them saying, hey guys, we don't even need to worry about the sheep here because peace has come. Of course, if they thought that and they went to see Jesus and then they came back to a flock that was slaughtered by wild animals, they might have been taken back. Like, wait a second. I mean, a heavenly host just told me that peace was on earth now. Or what about the scene in, in the stable or, or in the area where the manger was, where, where the Christ child was? What about the scene there? I don't know how many of you are new mothers or, or remember back to the day when you were. <clears throat> but you, can you imagine this scene? The, the manger filled with hay or straw and the Christ child, this Prince of Peace, this one who was just born is laid in it. Can you imagine the hope on the faces of all involved. Here he is. This is him. This is the one that the prophets prophesied of. The one to come and bring peace. I can picture them looking at his sweet face so expectantly. And I can see his sweet face looking up at them. Perhaps with a little bit of a smile on it. And as they were looking there, waiting uh, and looking expectantly at this child, all of a sudden I, I could picture the Lord Jesus breaking out into a loud cry. You might say, wait a minute, the song that we just sang this morning, Away in a Manger, declares that no crying he made. Well, I would, I would say to you that, that is, that's baloney. Why can I say that? Well, think about this. Jesus came as a baby. What do babies do? Babies cry because they get hungry. Babies, babies need change. They cry. Babies are uncomfortable and they don't know why. They cry. But wait, how could you say that, that the Prince of Peace would have cried as he was laying in the manger? Well, listen to this. Maybe you have considered this before. Maybe you haven't. Jesus, if you look back through the Gospels, Jesus cried as an adult. Why would he not have cried as a baby? And so take, go back to the, to the scene surrounding the manger and, and the Christ child beginning to cry. You know those kind of cries that keep you up all night? You know those kind of cries that's like, I don't know what else to do and I'm tired. Yeah, I'm sure he cried like that. And maybe to the people looking on they were thinking, wait, this is the Prince of Peace? 
Because things don't feel real peaceful right now. We also sang a song this morning, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. And perhaps you might be uh, feeling the same thing as the hymn writer that wrote this hymn. The second verse says, I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Verse 3, and in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Perhaps you look around and you see, uh, you see a lack of peace that, that boggles the, the mind, boggles the imagination. You see a lack of peace that, that, that really is the pandemic. We have a lack of peace in this world. And you look at that and you say, how possibly could the Prince of Peace have arrived? We don't see these prophecies fulfilled. We don't see this kind of, kind of worldwide peace. We don't see this kind of external, horizontal peace that, that we so desperately long for. We see, we see conflict everywhere. Perhaps you, with the hymn writer, say there is no peace on earth. I bow my head. Listen, there is a very natural desire for the peace that is manifested by the absence of trouble. There is a very real, godly desire for that peace that is manifested by an absence of trouble, an absence of conflict altogether. Let me assure you that that peace that that manifestation of peace is coming. It is coming. It will be revealed during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ here on earth. The peace that he came to bring, which we'll talk about that is here right now, it will be manifested in a worldwide, in a, in a, in a lack of conflict all over the place. And so hang on, be of good cheer, because that is coming. The, the, the peace that Jesus said he is leaving, that will be manifested one day by an absence of conflict. But it's not manifested that way right now. But that doesn't mean that the Prince of Peace hasn't come. That doesn't mean that, that the Christ child that was laid in a manger is not the Prince of Peace. Those prophecies that we read absolutely will happen. But you see, right now, the peace that is here is real. It's a reality. We have to understand that horizontal conflict, all of the stuff that you see worked out externally, that horizontal conflict is a result of vertical conflict. The horizontal lack of peace is a result of a a, a vertical lack of peace. This is one thing that we have to understand, that, that the external conflict is, is a symptom of internal conflict. This is important for us to understand as we are considering the Prince of Peace and, and the coming of Him. Romans chapter 5 is one of the places that, that I will direct you. Romans chapter 5 verse 10, speaks of the conflict that is a reality in the lives of people as default. Romans 10 says, For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. How much more so, now that we are reconciled, will we, will we be saved by His life? Do you see that very first part of that verse? For if while we were enemies, stop the lack of peace that we have is, is, a, is a result directly of this lack of peace with God. The lack of peace horizontally is a direct result of a lack of peace vertically. Romans 5.1, though, listen to this. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, so, so the Prince of Peace who has come has come and has brought peace. It hasn't been manifested yet like we wish it would be, but he has come. 
and brought peace. This is exactly why the Prince of Peace had to come, the way he did the first time. He brought peace when there was no peace. Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. I encourage you to read through this later on. Uh, verses 15 through 20. Uh, speaks of Jesus coming. Um, and, and I will just read the last, uh, the last verse. And so breaking in on a sentence here. But it says that through him, through who? Through Christ. Through, through Christ, the, the, the incarnation of God himself, through Christ, through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This was the biggest problem. And, and a lot of you know this already. Some of you don't. This was the biggest problem. This is the biggest, um, well, the only reason why there is a lack of peace is because we have been separated from God because of sin. That's why it started back in Genesis chapter 3. And so this separation brings lack of peace, conflict, because there is a lack of peace with God, there is a lack of peace everywhere else. And so this is why the Prince of Peace had to come the way he did the first time, as a baby, not as a conquering king. This is why he had to come, because... His goal was to address the issue at the root. The issue of our lack of peace. He came to address that at the root, which is why Colossians says, He made peace by the blood of His cross. The cross was the infant's goal. The cross was the way that He was going to address that conflict between God and man. So now that anybody who trusts in the one Jesus, the Savior, the Prince of Peace, anyone who trusts in Him has peace. See, maybe we don't have peace in the absence of trouble. But because of Jesus, we can have peace. This, this contentment, this, this peace, this lack of conflict, it doesn't make any sense to a, a watching world. This is how we can have peace in the midst of trouble. This is how we can have peace in the midst of things not being okay. Because in trusting in the Prince of Peace, we have been reconciled to God. We have been made right with Him. And so the Prince of Peace has come for this very purpose. And so I just want you to know that even though you are dealing with stuff, listen, you can have peace with God through Jesus Christ in the midst of it all. In the midst of it all. Trust Him. That's one of the reasons why the Bible calls it a peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that frankly doesn't make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? Well, because everything out here isn't right. It isn't all fixed. Yet, in the midst of it, we can still have this peace with Him. And so listen, all of this stuff to say that, that we are called to live a life of, of peace. The thing about the Prince of Peace who has come, we are called to live a life of peace. And so, what to give to the one who has it all? Let's come right back to this. What to give to the one who has it all? What to, maybe you have people that you're supposed to buy for, or that, that you want to buy for. I don't want to say supposed to. The, the person that we, we want to give a gift to, but, man, what do we give them because they have it all? Sometimes you look at your parents this way, perhaps. And sometimes when you ask your parents, what, what do you want for Christmas? Sometimes they say, nothing, nothing. Maybe sometimes, though, they will say, listen, instead of anything material, here's what I want. I want you siblings. I, I heard this growing up, growing up. Here's what I want for Christmas. I want you guys to be at peace. I want you guys to, to love one another. I want you guys to live in this way. That's what I want. That's all I want. So what to give to the one who has it all? Listen, the Lord wants from us. There's nothing that we have that he didn't give us. Okay, so he doesn't need our money. He calls us to give 
be sure of that. But he doesn't need our money. Everything that we have has come from him. And so what is it that he desires from us that we should consider this day? He desires for us to walk in peace. He desires for us to, to use what it is that he has given us. To take advantage of what it is that he has given us. And peace is one of those things. So listen, living a life of peace and considering uh, what to give him, considering to, to live a life of peace, living this life of peace is not a call for behavior modification. This is not a call from God to, for you to, to modify your behavior. For you to, to be at peace, to strive to be at peace with your neighbor. This is not a, a call for behavior modification for you to, to do some kind of self-talk to keep you from worrying about the things that you worry about. This is not a call for you to try harder to be at peace. Rather, two things. First, it's a call for you and for me to really know him. To really know this Prince of Peace. And so I would challenge you, if you don't know him, if you do not really know the peace that God offers us in Jesus Christ, the reason why he came as a baby, if you don't know this peace that God offers, let me encourage you so strongly. Know him. Trust in Jesus. He reconciles us to God. By faith in Jesus, by trusting in him, we are made right before God. And that brings a peace that you cannot even imagine right now. Let me encourage you to know him. This is what it means to live a life of peace, to know the Prince of Peace. This is what he wants from you. The second thing, to those of us who do know the Prince of Peace, to do know peace with God through Jesus Christ, listen, it is a call for us to keep our eyes on him. I don't have to tell you all that you don't always feel peaceful. You don't always feel at peace. You don't always feel it. I would encourage you, by the way, um, as a side note, do not get sucked into feelings. Because we're not always going to feel peaceful. But we don't always sense the peace that God has for us in Jesus Christ, do we? I believe this, this, this call to live a life of peace is a reminder, is a call for us to keep our eyes fixed on to keep your eyes fixed on the Prince of Peace. Listen, Isaiah chapter 26. This, uh, this principle holds fast. Listen, uh, verse 3, chapter 26 of Isaiah. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. What does having our eyes fixed on Jesus look like? What does our eyes fixed on this, this Prince of Peace look like? Having our thoughts turn often to the Lord. Instead of on all of the chaos around us and all of the lack of peace around us. But he is sucked into all of that. But I believe this call to, to have our eyes fixed on him, to have our thoughts turn often to the Lord. This draws us into remembering who he is. And as we remember who he is, this Prince of Peace, we will begin to sense this peace more and more and more. Colossians 3.15, and I realize that we have not got to the John passage yet, and so I'm going to be uh, getting there here in just a second as we close. <clears throat> but Colossians, listen to this, Colossians chapter 3, we are called... Uh, 3.15. It's Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Listen to what the Apostle Paul is writing to the Colossians. He says this, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to indeed, I'm sorry, to which you indeed were called in one body, and be thankful. Did you hear that? <clears throat> and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The peace of Christ that we have is the gospel. 
that we have because of faith in him. The peace of Christ, the peace with God through Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, let it rule in your hearts. The wording there for, for rule is to basically call the shots. If Paul is calling us to let that rule or call the shots in our life, that infers that we have the ability not to. We have the ability not to let it rule in our lives. Even though we experience, we have that peace with God through Jesus, we have the ability not to let it rule in our hearts. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is calling us to let it. And I believe part of that is keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, Isaiah 26.3. Finally, John 14 passage. Now this is not a typical Advent uh, scripture. However, this coming right from the Prince of Peace, fast forward from when he was uh, born and laid in the manger, fast forward many years later. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. This is Jesus speaking to us. Beginning in verse 25 of John 14. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. We just stop right there. Do you hear what Jesus said? Peace I leave you. The reason he came is to look toward the cross, to go to the cross. What did he do in the cross? Colossians 1 tells us that he made peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus said, my peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. The world gives and takes away, you know. But no, I leave my peace with you. And then what Jesus said was this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Why? Our hearts get troubled. They get troubled. How do they get troubled? I firmly believe it's because we take our eyes off of him. When we start realizing this, uh, this lack of peace, even though we have been positionally made at peace with God, how do we experience it? I believe we get our eyes off of him. Look at Peter when he was out of the boat. He was walking to Jesus on the water. And he took his eyes off of Jesus. And he saw all of the chaos around him. And what happened? He began to experience a lack of peace. Because he took his eyes off of Jesus. What about David and the chaos? Psalm chapter 3. Check that out later. You've probably heard me mention it once uh, before. But when David was in, uh, was in conflict, <clears throat> not knowing what to do, chaos all around he remembered who God was, essentially fixing his eyes on him. And you see the peace manifested in his life. How? He says, I lay down and slept. Finally, how about Jesus in the boat? During the storm, when they were on the sea and the, and, and the waves were great and the wind was strong and, and the disciples were freaking out because things were not peaceful. But Jesus was at peace. He was sleeping in the boat. How? Well, because he had peace. He knew who he was and he knew who the Father was. I want to encourage you to continue to consider this, this peace that is made available to us by the Prince of Peace, who has come, who has brought peace on earth. There is peace. Not manifested quite the way we want to see it yet. That will come. But we have peace with God through Jesus. And we can continue to realize that as we fix our eyes on him. What would he like for Christmas? What is a way that we can worship him this Christmas? Well, to know this peace that he offers. To know this peace that he has made available to us. And that we would walk in it. That's what we've been called to. So let's. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you so much for this Advent season, for <clears throat> the coming of the Christ child. Lord, I praise you for, for the ability that we have to be at peace with God through Jesus. I thank you for the reality of that peace now, Lord, even when we are living in a world that is nuts. I thank you for that peace that we have with Jesus now. I pray that if there are those who have never experienced that, 
who don't know that, Lord, I pray that even now that they would, uh, would fall on their knees, in essence, confessing their sin, repenting, and, and calling out to Jesus, trusting in Him. And I pray that as they do that, Lord, they would sense a, a, what has often been described as a weight off of my shoulders. Why? Because there they are made positionally right with God. And Lord, for those of us who do know that, God, I pray that you would help us to live this life of peace, to walk in it, fixing our eyes on you all of the way. We praise you, Father. You are so good to us. Lord, I pray your hand of blessing upon us as we, uh, as we go. Father, that you would help us to continue to meditate on your word. Again, help us to be in awe once again that during this time of year uh, about what it is that you have done for us in Jesus. We look forward to his second advent, the second coming, when this peace will be manifested in a broader scope, Lord, even in nature itself. We thank you. We look to you with thanksgiving and an expectation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, uh, thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, I pray that you would just continue to get into his word. Um, seek his face. Live a life of peace.